Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Very pleased to see so many people here this afternoon, and welcome to the university and the school if you haven't been here before. Um, I'm Andrew Coleman, I'm a professor in the school, and this event, annual event, is named in memory of Professor Vladislav Slukin, who was um, the head of this department from 1973 to 1984, department as it then was, and he was also the dean of the Faculty of Science, within which psychology was then located. And when I joined the department in 1970, he was the editor of the British Journal of Psychology. Um, I'm the only person left in this department who overlapped with him. And in fact, although his main research, the research for which he's best known, is in animal early learning, he had wide interests. And I collaborated with him a lot on judgment and decision making. And on my CV, I've checked, I have 16 publications. Admittedly, only six of them are refereed journal articles, but we had a, a, a book and we had um, book chapters and various other publications. Um, th this is joint publications with Vlad Vladik Slukin and with other people who are in the I I audience today, actually, Julia Berryman there. And um, he had an enormous influence on my career and an enormous influence on the career of many others as well. Um, I'm especially glad that his son, Tim Slukin, his eldest son, is here today, from a uh, professor from Southampton University, professor of theoretical physics. And also present are a bunch of graduates from the 1970s who all knew Vladik Slukin, were taught by him. Who, who I met, met up with yesterday, who, who, who graduated in the 70s and have kept touch with each other and with, with me. Um, and they're also, of course, friends of the Slukin family here and members of the school. Uh, so let me introduce today's Slukin lecturer. He's on my left here. He's Dr. Richard Cook, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Leeds. <clears throat> and Honorary Research Fellow at the University of York. And before joining the University of Leeds, he was a lecturer and then a senior lecturer at City University and then a reader at Birkbeck University of London. He was awarded the Elizabeth Warrington Prize by the British Neuropsychological Society in 2018 and the Spearman Medal by the British Psychological Society in 2020. For those of you who are not academic psychologists, these are uh, uh, very prestigious awards. And his lecture today is entitled Developmental Prosopagnosia, Lifelong Face Blindness. So give him a hand before we begin. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to give the, the 2024 Slukin Lecture. It's a wonderful honour. Um, I hope I can live up to that very, uh, very generous introduction. Um, so this evening I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, developmental prosopagnosia. So this is um, a topic that I've, I've been researching um, for the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, so... Obviously, I'm just going to start with a, uh, an introduction uh, to hopefully give you some idea about what, what on earth developmental prosopagnosia is. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the diagnostic procedures that we use. Uh, I'll give you some idea, hopefully, of uh, what, what I, I mean by developmental prosopagnosia. Then I'll um, move on to the diagnostic procedures that we use when we, um, when we meet a new, a new individual with, with the condition. Um, I'll, I'll give you a very uh, brief overview about kind of what we think we know about the, the causes of the condition. Um, and then in the final part of the talk, I'll, um, I'll sort of briefly uh, touch on three, three separate questions um, that my, my lab uh, have been interested in over, over the last um, 10 or so years, um, specifically uh, whether um, individuals with uh, developmental prosopagnosia have impaired face perception or impaired face memory. 
um, whether individuals um, struggle to recognise facial expressions. Um, and finally, the, the sort of this really thorny question at the end about whether um, developmental prosopagnosia is, is, a, is a face specific condition or whether, um, whether the perceptual difficulties that we see in this population, whether they um, extend to, to other non-face uh, visual stimuli. Okay, so what is developmental prosopagnosia? So um, most people take for granted the ability to recognise faces. Um, most people in the general population uh, can recognise others by their facial appearance uh, quickly and effortless, effortlessly. Um, however, some people uh, really struggle in this, in this domain. Um, and this term prosopagnosia was first coined uh, in the 1940s by a German neurologist called Joe Chim Bodimer. Um, and Bodimer was working with a lot of uh, soldiers who were coming back from the Second World War, um, many, many of whom had sustained traumatic brain injuries. And as a result of those brain injuries, um, some of them were, were struggling to recognise faces. And so, so Bodimer was the first to, to coin this term prosopagnosia. So the, it's a bit of a mouthful, um, but it basically comes from the Greek for uh, face, so prosopon, and uh, without knowledge or non-knowledge, uh, agnosia. Journalists and people in the media love to use this term face blindness. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer uh, insofar as people with prosopagnosia aren't blind to faces. They uh, can recognise that two eyes... Uh, a nose and a mouth is a face. Um, the, the problem that people with prosopagnosia have is individuating different faces and thereby recognising others based on, on their facial appearance. So again, uh, frequently in the media you'll see sort of um, images like, like these two. Um, and although they sort of you know, give you the gist that people with prosopagnosia have problems um, perceiving faces, obviously this is not a in any way, shape, or form, um, a realistic depiction of, of what it is like to have prosopagnosia. You can still, obviously, you, you still see, um, you know, the the, the face. Um, there are two forms of prosopagnosia. So, um, in acquired cases, individuals uh, grow up um, and develop typical face recognition expertise, and then lose that ability as a result of a brain injury. So the cases, the cases of prosopagnosia that were studied by Bodimer, um, these were acquired cases. The, um, I'm interested in the second type, so developmental or congenital uh, cases of prosopagnosia. So these individuals, for one reason or another, simply, do, simply fail to develop the typical expertise with face recognition that most of us take for granted. The growing interest in developmental prosopagnosia uh, accords very well with the, the sort of emerging framework uh, in which face recognition, face recognition ability is conceived of as a, a distributed trait. So um, most people have relatively average face recognition ability. Um, there are some people in the population who are lucky enough to have exceptional face recognition ability. So these are... Um, increasingly known as super recognisers. And some of you may have you know, read articles in the, in the media um, that describe how individuals with, you know, these, these super recogniser individuals are working alongside the Metropolitan Police, for example. The Met are sending in um, individuals who, who have this exceptional face recognition ability um, in, in sort of riot situations, for example, and then uh, bringing them in um, later in the, uh, in the criminal justice uh, process uh, to provide expert um, testimony. I think the most, the most straightforward way to conceive of developmental prosopagnosia is that it's, it's the other end of the distribution. So, um, obviously, uh, people who, who sort of struggle very badly to recognise faces. Right from the outset, I'm going to you know, really emphasise this idea that um, these, these individual differences that we see in face recognition ability are entirely unrelated to general intelligence. So it's, it's, a, it's a very unusual trait insofar as it's 
um, it's largely thought to be heritable, um, but it doesn't correlate with, with general intelligence, G. Um, and so most, most cognitive abilities uh, are found to correlate with general intelligence, and this is, this is quite unusual insofar as it doesn't. Um, it's not, um, it's thought to be largely unrelated to visual acuity. So, so um, it's not a case that these guys just need to put their glasses on or put their contact lenses in and, and they can recognize faces better. Um, most of these guys uh, drive, for example. They have very normal, uh, what, we would, what we would refer to as low level vision. Um, and, and again, it's not really associated with, with wider cognitive impairments. So it's not, there aren't wider problems with um, their, their, their memory. The individuals I'm going to be talking about today um, are developmental prosopagnosics. So um, they don't have uh, any history of brain injury. Um, they've got no history of stroke. So, um, so obviously this is in contrast with these acquired cases of prosopagnosia um, that have been studied by uh, Joachim Bodimer. I'm often asked how, how common is, is developmental prosopagnosia. So what's, what's the incidence in, in the population? This is, this is not a straightforward question to answer insofar as um, you know, how many people qualify as developmental, develop, you know, so having developmental prosopagnosia um, is in, inextricably linked to how liberal or conservative uh, your diagnostic criteria are. Um, what we can say is that around one in 50 members of the general population experience lifelong face recognition problems that are severe enough to disrupt their daily lives. So most people, I think, would recognise uh, the experience of you know, being on a, a train and, and seeing somebody who you, know, you, you, you kind of can't shake the sense that they're familiar. Um, and it's only when you get home, it's like, ah, you know... Um, they lived around the corner from me, you know, 10 years ago or something. Um, so, you know, there, there are sort of face recognition fails um, that, that we all recognise and happen to us sort of sporadically. That's not the sort of thing we're talking about here. We're talking about, um, you know, one in 50 people experience uh, daily challenges in, in terms of their face recognition um, that, that are associated with, you know, a, avoiding social situations. Um, the number of people who re reach the, cons the sort of more conservative diagnostic criteria that we would employ in, in a sort of research setting, um, I, I would estimate that to be around one in 200. Uh, so, so certainly not everybody who would, would describe um, sort of some level of face recognition problems would, would reach that threshold. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what those, what those sort of diagnostic tests look like in, in just a moment. Um, so this is, in terms of the, the incidence, um, when I say one in 200 or one in 50, I'm talking about sort of from the general population. Um, I think a really interesting um, insight that's emerged over the last 10 years um, is that the, the incidence of developmental prosopagnosia is much higher in certain populations in certain communities. And so the, the best example is the autistic population, where um, possibly as many as one in six experience like, you know, lifelong face recognition problems that really Im impact on their social interaction. And so we've, we've actually, um, over the last few months, we've, we've collected some really interesting data that suggests that... Um, Although social, social interaction anxiety um, is a very common feature of autism, um, that the, it, it's actually quite predicted by individuals' face recognition ability. So I think that's a really kind of interesting avenue for future research. Um, again, just to stress the fact that autism and prosopagnosia are, are independent constructs. So there are individuals uh, you know, individuals exist who have autism without prosopagnosia. Uh, many, many individuals have prosopagnosia and don't have autism. Um, this is simply reference to the fact that um, there are a large proportion of people with autism who also have uh, developmental prosopagnosia. 
we, we've been lucky enough um, in my lab to work with, um, I would say, around 800 people with developmental prosopagnosia uh, uh, over the last decade or so. Um, and it's become uh, increasingly obvious that, that sort of there are certain characteristic experiences that um, a great many individuals share. So, as you might expect, if you have problems recognising others based on their facial appearance, you develop strategies and sort of other, other ways of identifying uh, familiar others that, you, that you're interacting with. Developmental prosopagnosics frequently uh, cite uh, the use of uh, others' voice, uh, their hairstyle, their clothing, whether they've got a particular coat or a bag, and they, they'll use these features to recognise um, and identify other people that they, uh, like their girlfriend or their, um, their work colleagues and so on. These kind of strategies, obviously, um, give rise to predictable problems. So, for example, prosopagnosics often struggle in situations where everybody's required to wear a uniform. So, uh, prosopagnosia is a real problem in, in the military. Um, a number of our prosopagnosics uh, describe, you know, really difficult school experiences, if they've, particularly if they've gone to a school where there's, you know, everybody's wearing a uniform. Um, we had one, one situation where um, a, a child was being bullied, but she, she couldn't actually identify who was bullying her, and so she was essentially scared of everybody, um, which, is, which is awful. We've also been in, uh, in touch with a, a parent who is having terrible problems recognising their child um, at the school gate because all the children are wearing the same, the same uniform, have very similar um, hair and so, so on. Um, again, big difficulties when um, sort of familiar others change their appearance. So the, the really obvious example is when they, they have a different hairstyle. Um, you know, this can really throw, throw um, individuals with prosopagnosia. Another sort of anecdotal experience that, that often comes up when we talk with, with developmental prosopagnosics um, is this problem of following movies. So um, particularly where there are a number of um, prominent characters who all, sort of broadly speaking, have a similar appearance. I'm... I'm always sort of a little bit tickled by the fact that they, uh, they always cite the same kinds of film. So, um, so I don't know if, if any of you have watched, uh, there's a, a Martin Scorsese film called The Departed, and the, the kind of lead, lead characters are played by Leonardo DiCaprio and, and Matt Damon, and it follows the um, sort of tumultuous uh, sort of histories of, of this, this kind of good, good guy who's, who's kind of undercover in this crime organisation and this bad cop um, who's, you know, in, in the FBI or something. And the, the film kind of cuts backwards and forwards between these two, these two characters. And developmental prosopagnosics just can't follow this for, for anything. They, they really struggle. Another one that they often cite is Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. It's very, very difficult for them to, to, to sort of follow the different plots and, and sort of characters. Um, just to kind of really, you know, um, emphasise this, the, the, the difference between the kinds of experiences that, um, that developmental prosopagnosics will talk about um, and how, how these differ from the kind of occasional face recognition problems that, that sort of most of us would recognise. Um, it's, not, it's not uncommon for, um, for prosopagnosics to, to have difficulties recognising friends and family. So I've, you know, I've already given you the example of... Um, uh, a prosopagnosic who, who struggled to recognise their, 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 their daughter at the school gates. Um, you know, it's, it's really common for people to have, have really embarrassing stories about how they, they failed to recognise their girlfriend and this caused them like, terrible problems. Um, they, uh, again, um, not, not everybody, but a, a lot of people with prosopagnosia describe um, how it's caused them social anxiety and sort of impacted their self-esteem. Many, uh, many people, you know, particularly 20 or 30 years ago, um, were told when they were children, um, you know, their, their parents assumed that they, they were struggling to recognise others because they simply weren't paying attention or they weren't trying hard enough. And, um, and so 
you know, I think this, you know, this, this kind of narrative, this kind of slightly misleading narrative has really, um, in many cases, really uh, impacted the self-esteem of people. And they actually, you know, when they uh, sort of find out about developmental prosopagnosia and they, they, they sort of reach out to this, they, they find out that there's, there's this whole community of people who have a similar kind of, uh, exp have had similar experiences to them. I think it can be quite an emotional experience and quite an emotional journey for them. Um, it's also very common uh, for developmental prosopagnosics to describe professional difficulties. Um, we're in contact with uh, a doctor who's, who's having problems. We're also in contact with a head teacher um, who's, who's extremely anxious that it may, it may emerge that he has prosopagnosia. Um, obviously, if that became wide knowledge, I think there's, you know, there's, there's the danger that students might take advantage of that. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in, in sort of hearing more about the kinds of experiences that, that developmental prosopagnosics describe, um, this, is our, this is our website, Trouble With Faces, and on our insights page, it's, uh, um, developmental prosopagnosics have the opportunity to describe um, what it's like to have, have prosopagnosia. There have been uh, several celebrities who have identified as, as prosopagnosic. Um, well, certainly they've, they've said that they have, they've had problems recognising faces all their life. Um, several prominent uh, actors, actresses, um, so Stephen Fry, Brad Pitt and Joanna Lumley have all identified as, as prosopagnosic. Um, several academics, so um, Paul Dirac, um, famous quantum physicist, uh, described the Dirac equation, um, and Jane Goodall, so well-known primatologist, um, again, sort of has, has spoken quite candidly about problems recognising faces. Steve Wozniak, so one of the co-founders of Apple with Steve Jobs, has, is sort of a well-known prosopagnosic. Um, and Duncan Ballantyne, he's probably slightly uh, out, of, out of the media these days, but he was, uh, for, for, for several years, he was on uh, Dragon's Den, I think. Okay, so hopefully I've given you a, a, a flavour of what, uh, what developmental prosopagnosia is and kind of what it's like to have the condition. Um, now I just want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the kinds of diagnostic uh, tests and procedures that um, we administer when we're approached by a new, a new prosopagnosic or somebody who we think might have prosopagnosia. Um, basically, our, our approach rests on this idea that the most reliable uh, diagnosis or, or classification um, is achieved when you have convergent self-report evidence and um, sort of low scores on objective computer-based tests of, of face recognition ability. Having, having administered face recognition tests to, to sort of large cohorts of undergraduates, I'm, I'm very suspicious that uh, low test scores, particularly on a Friday afternoon, um, you know, sometimes you know may not reveal that an individual has prosopagnosia, and maybe um, just reveals that they would rather not be not be doing a test on a Friday. Um, so I think it is important that, that that sort of poor poor scores on a test are accompanied by um, some signs that that the individuals struggle with face recognition outside the lab. Um, so. When, when somebody approaches us and says, you know, I think I, I, think I might have prosopagnosia, I've re read about it in the paper, and I, I think this describes me, me, me very well. So the first thing we do is, is talk to them, obviously. Uh, so there are sort of semi-structured um, diagnostic interviews uh, that, that people have developed to, to sort of probe people's experiences of face recognition and um, to see whether they, you know, to kind of try and elicit whether they, they meet this, they fit this profile. Um, there are also two self-report questions, questionnaires, that, again, inquire about people's face recognition experiences. The one, the one that we use is the PI-20, the, or the 20-item prosopagnosia index. For a time, this was available on, on the BBC website. I don't know, I don't know if it still is. Um, but, yes, the idea is that it's, it's based on um, kind of anecdotes and, and experiences that are, have been volunteered by, by prosopagnosics, and you simply, um, yeah, there you go. You simply describe on a, a five-point scale to what extent each of these 
statement describes your particular experiences of, of face recognition. So for example, um, so if you look at number 14, I, I sometimes find movies hard to follow uh, because of difficulties recognizing characters. Um, you know, number five, I, when, I, when I was at school, I struggled to recognize my classmates. So you can see it's based on, on the kinds of uh, experiences and anecdotes that uh, it, process prognosis often, often volunteer. And what we do is we simply, um, you know, sum up your score. And if you, um, we, you know, in our experience, a score of over 65 is a, a pretty good indication that um, somebody, somebody might well have developmental process prognosia. The next step is obviously to, to give people objective computer-based tests that assess their, their face recognition ability. So one of, the, one of the most straightforward and also one of the most diagnostic tests um, is based on famous face recognition. So stimuli will, it will look something like this. Um, we have obviously the, the uh, outline, the external facial feature have, have external facial features have been removed um, to give these different celebrities this kind of egg-like ap uh, appearance. Um, that's simply because prosopognosics, one of the strategies that prosopognosics often fall back on is recognizing hairstyle. Um, and so by, by sort of preventing them from using hairstyle and forcing them to, to kind of use the internal facial features, um, the test is, is more diagnostic. So, yeah, so basically the test simply pre pre uh, presents one of these faces at a time and participants have to try and name them. And if they can't name them, provide some sort of uh, information about them to, to kind of reveal that they've recognized who it is. So for example, you, um, you, know, you may uh, sort of recognize this chap, but you might sort of forget his name. Um, but if you said to us, oh, well, you know, he, he used to captain the, the England football team, um, he had a great right foot and sort of, you know, took really good corners and free kicks. Um, we would accept that you had recognised David Beckham, even if you, even if you couldn't, uh, couldn't retrieve his name. Um, obviously, once or twice, you know, the, the, the kinds of celebrities we use are iconic. So they're, they're sort of well known to almost everybody. Um, but... At the end, we always kind of uh, we, we always give people a list of the names of the, the people we've used in the test, and if there are people who the participant is unfamiliar with, obviously we'll we'll kind of remove that item um, and adjust their their score accordingly. So famous face recognition is is incredibly useful, but it um, it depends on your ability to to kind of retrieve and and remember a face that you've encountered outside the lab. So, so most, uh, most labs investigating prosopognosia will also use unfamiliar face matching as a, as a sort of diagnostic test. So the most famous example of this is the, the Cambridge face memory test. In, uh, in the kind of early, early part of the test, you'll learn um, a, a series of different target faces so you'll be presented um, this individual to, to learn um, and told that in, in the subsequent phases of the test, you're going to have to try and identify this individual. Um, and then in, the, in these uh, subsequent recognition phases, you'll be given a lineup of three different individuals and you've, you've got to pick out the, the individual, the target individuals. As you work through the test, the, um, the sort of difficulty, the level of difficulty is increased by changing the viewpoint and through the introduction of uh, visual noise. This is, um, again, it's a, a kind of common strategy for, for prosopognosics to try and um, pick out an, an individual by um, finding a blemish or a mark on their face or even, even like a specular highlight or something. Um, and so the addition of this high spatial frequency noise is... Um, is to try and prevent people from using, using those kind of uh, very sort of trivial image-based cues. Um, before I move on to the next stage, I just want to sort of uh, very briefly kind of talk a little bit about diversity. So um, 
So today, almost all of the people that we're approached by, in terms of um, people who approach our lab and, and say, I think I might have prosopagnosia, um, the vast majority identify as white British. So, so that's something to bear in mind, obviously, when, um, when I'm talking a little bit about our, our studies um, and sort of our empirical results a bit later on. Um, and I think it's fair to say that kind of members of ethnic minorities are underrepresented uh, throughout um, research in, in developmental prosopagnosia. I think that's a very, uh, a very complex problem. I would, you know, I'd, I'm, I'm very keen to do something about this, but um, I think it's important to recognise that it's, it is a multifaceted uh, issue. Um, so, for example, I think, um, I think it's true that members of ethnic minorities are under, you know, in terms of all neurodevelopmental conditions, so things like autism, for example, and dyslexia, um, members of ethnic minorities are, are sort of underdiagnosed. Um, again, the perception of universities and research is that there's, there's quite a lot of white privilege and sort of, um, I think this may, may sort, of, sort of prevent some people from approaching us. Um, and again, a lot of face researchers and, and prosopagnosia researchers identify as, as white, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that, that doesn't help as well in terms of encouraging members of ethnic minorities to, to kind of approach, approach us. I think there may also be um, some, something to do with the sort of the negative uh, kind of racial stereotypes that may make it harder for, for people who, um, you know, with, with autism and prosopagnosia and so on, um, to kind of talk openly about sort of um, cognitive issues or perceptual issues that sort of may be um, mistaken for, for sort of laziness or, or, or stupidity. So, like I said a, a bit earlier, um, a lot of prosopagnosics when they're growing up are sort of mistakenly told, you know, you've got to pay more attention. You've got to, you've got to try harder to recognise people. Um, and so there may be, there may be something, um, there may be some sort of interesting interactions here with, with sort of racial stereotypes. Okay. Um, so, so next, I want to uh, consider what we, what we know or what we think we know um, about the causes of, of developmental prosopagnosia. So, um, so one thing I think that we can be pretty confident about is that there's, there's a genetic basis. So it's, it's very clear now that prosopagnosia runs in families. Um, this, was, this was first described by uh, Brad Deshane and colleagues in uh, 2007. He found a family um, in which 10, 10 separate members uh, um, either tested positive for, for prosopagnosia or there was, there was kind of strong anecdotal evidence that um, the individuals kind of struggled to recognise faces. And this has been, um, since this initial report in 2007, this has been replicated uh, sort of half a dozen times. Um, and certainly we're in, we're in contact with uh, individual prosopagnosics who have family members um, who, who seem to have the same, uh, the same problem with face recognition. And so, so obviously, the, the, the kind of uh, the important um, sort of conclusion from this uh, or implication is that um, prosopagnosia has a, a genetic component if it's if it's running in families, and this this fits in very well with what we um, you know what we know about other neurodevelopmental conditions like dyslexia and um, and autism and so on. This also um, this also accords very well with. Um, evidence from twin studies or, or behavioural genetics. So, if you um, if you consider identical twins or, or monozygotic twins, um, if you if you take the um, the face recognition ability of one twin, it's a very good predictor of the face recognition ability of the other twin. Okay, so there's a very strong correlation between the face recognition of, of one twin and the other twin. And so interestingly, um, that correlation is much weaker in non-identical twins or dizygotic twins. And you know, when you first um, when you first think about this, this this may may seem quite counterintuitive. Obviously, identical twins and non-identical twins are both growing up in the same environment at the same time. One of the um, 
One of the, the really fascinating features of identical twins, though, is that they, um, they share 100% of their genes. So um, from a purely genetic point of view, identical twins are essentially you know, genetic clones of each other. Um, whereas non-identical twins uh, share 50% of their genes. So that's, that's similar to any, any other sibling, or any, any, um, any two siblings would, would be expected to share around 50% of their genes. So, um, so the suggestion is clearly that um, it's this additional, uh, the fact that identical twins are sharing 100% of their genes is responsible for the, the stronger correlation we're seeing between their, their face recognition abilities. And so it's, um, the, these kind of twin studies provide quite strong evidence for, uh, that face recognition ability um, is, is a, a genetic or heritable trait. So, so yeah, so what causes developmental prosopagnosia? Well, you know, it looks like there's some sort of genetic factor in, in play or, or genetic factors in play. So what's, what's going on in the brain? What do, we, what do we know about what's going on in the brain of, of developmental prosopagnosics? Um, so functional um, MRI or magnetic resonance imaging is a tool that scientists use to identify um, which parts of the brain are implicated in different kinds of cognitive tasks. So we can stick somebody in, a, in an MRI scanner and we can see um, which parts of the, the visual system are active when they view faces or which parts are, uh, are active when they view cars or houses or objects and so on. And so using, using this method, scientists have identified um, several regions of the visual system that seem to respond very strongly to faces. Some would argue most strongly to faces, that they are tuned to, to, to faces. And so the, most, uh, the two most kind of well-known of these regions are the occipital face area, uh, sometimes called OFA, and the fusiform face area, sometimes called FFA. And so this is, um, this is actually the right hemisphere of a brain um, viewed from underneath. Okay, so your eyeball would be about here, um, and your, uh, your cerebellum would, would sit just, just under here. So we've taken away the cerebellum in order to kind of look at the, um, the underside of the brain, and this is, the, this is uh, known as the fusiform gyrus. Okay, so this is, um, so, so in some uh, functional MRI or, or fMRI has revealed a network of regions um, that seem to be implicated in, in face recognition. What we see in, in developmental prosopagnosia is um, that these individuals, we, we can find these regions in developmental prosopagnosics. So, uh, so DPs have an OFA and, and they seem to have a fusiform face area, an FFA. Um, but these areas seem to respond slightly less strongly to faces than they do in um, typical people with typical face recognition. So, for example, this is um, this is the results of a study described by um, Ji Hai Gao and colleagues. And as you can see, the um, so in orange is the the strength of the activation in in the fusiform face area elicited by by face stimuli. And it's kind of as you can see, it's it's kind of stronger in the the control individual. So these are individuals with typical face recognition. Um, there's a it, there's a significant activation, but it's a bit weaker in the, in the developmental prosopagnosics. A second, a second popular idea is that individuals with developmental prosopagnosia um, have differences in uh, white matter tracts, um, in particular those that run throughout the, the visual system. So... Uh, white matter tracks are essentially like telephone wires in the brain. They basically link up um, different, uh, different regions of, of cortical, um, different parts of the cortex. And when these telephone wires are, um, are sort of not plugged in correctly or sort of 
um, there, are, there, are, there aren't enough of them. Information is, is not processed in, a, in an efficient way. And um, in particular, the, there's a, a bundle of these telephone wires called the um, inferior longitudinal fasciculus that runs from the, um, that connects the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe. And so this is um, the parts of the brain that kind of form the, the sort of visual system. The, and in particular, the parts of the visual system that um, kind of has, have been shown to be really important for things like object recognition and face recognition. And um, certainly there's some evidence that the individuals with developmental prosopagnosia, um, that the, the layout of these uh, telephone wires in the brain is slightly uh, disorganized. So they have um, reduced density and coherence relative to um, people with typical face recognition ability. Okay, so in the final part, I'd just like to consider these, these three questions um, that have, have been of, of great interest to my lab over the last 10 years or so. Okay, so the first, the first question that I'd like to consider is whether prosopagnosia is associated with um, impaired face perception or poor face memory. So if you consider um, the two diagnostic tests that I, I, I talked about earlier, famous face recognition and the ability to kind of learn in one part of a, of a task some new faces and then in a, uh, in a subsequent part kind of retrieve and identify those newly learned faces. Poor performance on both of those tasks um, could in, in principle reflect a memory problem. You might have problems remembering the face of Sean Connery. Um, you might have problems remembering what Barack Obama looks like. Um, similarly, you might have problems remembering that face you, that you were just shown um, you know, a minute ago. I, um, the kind of work that we've done over the last few years suggests that that's not what's going on. Um, our work suggests that um, people with developmental prosopagnosia have a, uh, a fundamentally perceptual problem. They, they can't form uh, a perceptual description of the faces that they encounter. Um, they can't encode faces accurately, or they encode faces less accurately than, than typical, um, typical participants. So one, one line of evidence for this comes from uh, sort of face processing tasks that have very minimal, um, that place very minimal demands on visual memory. So, so there, are some, uh, there are some tasks that, um, that simply don't require the participant to memorize faces. And so this is, this is one example. It's called the Cambridge Face Perception Test. And so in this task, participants are given a, a target face and six test faces and what they have to do is use the, the mouse to drag and drop the test items um, or reorder the test items um, to the extent that they resemble the target face. So the idea is you put the test item that resembles the target face most closely at this end and the target face that resembles the target face uh, least at this end. And you, you score participants' performance in terms of the, the errors they make, in terms of the the deviation from the correct order. And what we see um, is that prosopagnosics find this kind of test very hard. Um, so the, the prosopagnosics um, are the dark dots here. And as you can see, they're making more errors. So poor performance, poorer performance on this measure is indicated by scores higher up the, the vertical axis. And so as you can see, controls, you know, people with typical face recognition, you know, they make they find this task very difficult as well. So they, they're, they're making quite a few errors. Um, it's just that the prosopagnosics are making more errors. So despite the fact that this task has very little memory demand, um, we're still seeing um, clear, a clear group difference um, in terms of the, the prosopagnosics and the controls. Another line of evidence for the for the idea that this is a, a kind of perceptual problem, so or, or a problem with encoding, um, comes from uh, studies that show that there's there's very little impact of increasing 
the memory demands of a task on the, um, the performance of, of prosognosix. So, so what we've done here is, uh, in, this, in this particular uh, experiment, we're presenting um, a target face for one second. They have to kind of retain in memory the target face for either two seconds or eight seconds. So the idea is that two seconds is, is relatively a relatively low memory demand, whereas eight seconds is a, a slightly larger memory demand. And then they have to pick out the, um, the target face from a lineup of six options. And what we see is that the, this memory load manipulation just makes no difference at all. Um, you know, the people, are, people with prosopagnosia are, are sort of just as impaired at two seconds as they are at eight seconds, okay? Obviously, if this were fundamentally a memory problem, a face memory problem, you would expect um, a relatively small difference here and a, and a much larger difference here. So it kind of, this result speaks against the, this kind of memory hypothesis. Um, and finally, I, uh, I just want to really hammer home this point that, um, that prospinosics don't have a problem with, with sort of memory or learning in general. It's a, it's, it's a more specific problem than that. Um, and so in my view, one of the, the, the nicest lines of evidence for, for that comes from voice recognition. So, you know, as we've spoken about already, the ability to recognize famous faces is a, is a lovely diagnostic task in terms of finding prosopagnosics. You know, they really struggle to recognize um, celebrity faces. And so you can see this here, is this difference here. So, um, so in terms of, of a famous face recognition task, um, the controls are, are up, up towards 80%, whereas the pros, prosopagnosics are sort of around 45%. Um, so this is obviously a, a very clear and marked difference between the groups. But if you, if you look at the exact same task, but based on people's voices, so to what extent you could recognize Sean Connery from the sound of his voice, or Barack Obama from the sound of his voice, um, the prosopagnosics are, are sort of performing almost at, at an almost identical level to the the typical controls. So, so this really underscores the fact that they, um, they know the celebrities and they can remember the celebrities just as well as the, um, the controls. So, so certainly in some domains, they're showing very normal memory performance. Okay, so um, the next question I, you know, we in my, in, in my lab, um, we have considered is whether or not prosopagnosics um, struggle to recognize facial expressions. So one suggestion is that, um, one suggestion is that, that prosopagnosia is, a, is a, a very particular problem, recognizing facial identity, um, whereas another possibility is that it's a, it's a slightly broader problem and that, kind of, that it might un, uh, impair a range of judgments that you might make about um, an individual's face. So we've tested this in a few different ways. And so um, just to kind of illustrate the kinds of approach we've used, what we've done here is we've used image morphing um, to present different facial expressions at different levels of intensity. So, so hopefully it should be relatively, relatively obvious that, that this eye region depicts kind of an angry facial expression. Um, but it's kind of the, the, the kind of anger sig signal in this stimulus is, uh, is weaker. It's been diluted by, by blending it with a, a neutral face. And so we've done this um, with, for a range of different emotions. And the idea is that we're going to simply present one of these, one of these eye regions and ask people, what, what expression does this depict? Um, and... What we find is that the prosopagnosics are doing pretty well. So um, they're certainly in the same ballpark as the typical controls. Um, if you do a, a kind of group level analysis, the, you know, the prosopagnosics are a little bit, um, a little bit down. There, there's, a, there's a slight deficit. Um, but this is certainly not as marked as we, as we see with um, 
the face identity recognition. That's, that's a story that we've, we've, we've replicated and, and sort of seen elsewhere. So, um, so sort of during the, the pandemic, we were kind of interested on the, uh, in the impact of face masks on people's ability to interpret facial expressions. Um, and so, so again, what we've got here is uh, di different facial expressions that are presented with and without a face mask. In the experiment, you would see one stimulus um, and then kind of briefly, so for half a second, and then you simply have to pick a label that best describes the, the expression that you've seen. In the unmasked condition, there's actually no statistically significant difference between the groups. Um, in the masked condition, there is a, there is a, uh, a significant difference, um, but this is relatively small. This is, this is small potatoes. It's like four or five percent. Okay, so it's, you know, at the group level, if you look hard enough with kind of relatively contrived um, lab tasks, um, you can see some difference in expression recognition, but this is subtle. And certainly, if you talk to prosognosics, um, most of them have, you know, experienced no expression recognition problems in their daily lives. So I would argue that this is, this is still important theoretically. Um, it kind of fits in with this idea that what may be going on is that prosopagnosics are, have, a, have a kind of perception encoding problem. Um, but yes, absolutely. I think it's uh, most, most prosopagnosics interpret facial expressions relatively, relatively uh, unimpaired. The final question I'd like to, to consider is whether prosopagnosia or developmental prosopagnosia is a face-specific disorder or whether it... Um, kind of affects or undermines their perception of other kinds of visual stimuli. So when we asked participants, what other kinds of, you know, are there, are there, are there other kinds of visual stimuli that you struggle with? We got some, inc with some fascinating results. Um, and so uh, just to talk you through the top one, um, this is a prosopagnosic we're going to call Jane. Whenever I'm getting picked up by my parents in their car, I have trouble recognising their car even though I'm familiar with it and I've spent a lot of time uh, with it and in it. I've taken to memorising the number plate and, you know, apart from the colour, this is generally the only identifier I look for. And similar, um, similar kinds of anecdotes have been described by um, other prosopagnosics. So this is quite a good steer that maybe car recognition is another issue, another uh, perceptual challenge that they, they, may, they may face. Um, Fortunately, um, there is a, an off-the-shelf, uh, standardised um, task that, that is available to assess people's ability to um, identify cars. This is called the Cambridge Car Memory Test. Um, it has an identical format to the Cambridge Face Memory Test. Um, so in just the same way, you're given target items to learn, and then, you know, in a subsequent test phase, you have to pick out the, the, the car, the target car, from a lineup of three options. Um, the results that we have seen with, you know, using this test, um, broadly speaking, support the, these anecdotes that I, I presented a few moments ago. Um, certainly at the group level, what we see is, is a statistically, you know, significant difference in terms of people's ability to... Um, identify the cars, the, the, the prosopagnosic's ability to identify the cars. Um, I've put the, what, uh, this, is the, this is the sort of deficit or difference that we would see on the Cambridge face memory test. And so as you can see, the, the group difference that we see on the car memory test is, is relatively small compared to the, the difference that we see on the face version. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's obviously breaching statistics uh, significance from a statistical point of view. Um, I think the, if you actually look at the individual differences that we see on this measure, again, it sort of tells quite an interesting story. So, um, so the, the kind of crucial thing here is the, the vertical access, access. So this is describing people's performance on the Cambridge car memory test. Um, the dark 
circles are the, the prosognosics and the light circles are the, the, the typical controls. So what this reveals is that the distribution is, is, is shifted relative to the typical, the typical distribution. But there are certainly some prosognosics who are almost you know, approaching ceiling levels of performance on this test. So, so yes, at the group level, there is, a, um, there is signs of, of impaired car identification, but certainly there are, there's also some signs of, um, of heterogeneity, and some, some individuals seem to be able to identify cars just fine. Um, another interesting observation is that developmental prosognosics seem to have some uh, problems perceiving um, and identifying different body shapes. So, um, so again, very similar, very straightforward task. We're going to show people a target stimulus, um, and then they retain it for three seconds, and then they've got to pick out the target from four options. And in this study, we've compared uh, faces, these kind of male torsos um, and cars again. And what we see is that... Um, Obviously, as expected, they've got a problem with faces. Again, we replicate the problem with cars. But it, all, this, this, this uh, deficit also seems to, to generalise to some extent to the perception of bodies. Um, and this is, this is quite interesting um, because it fits in quite well with the, the literature that we've, um, we've already touched on um, from functional neuroimaging, from fMRI. So... So again, this is the right side of a brain um, viewed from underneath. So the, the eyeball would be about here. Um, and uh, the kind of areas in green are the face, the face areas. So you've got the, the occipital face area and the fusiform face area. <coughs> but what's been overlaid um, are two, two areas, two parallel areas that also seem to um, support the perception of human bodies. And so this, is some, this, this one's called the extra striated body area. Um, and this one uh, of particular interest is called the fusiform body area. And to some extent, there's, the, there's an overlap uh, between the fusiform face area and the, and the fusiform body area. So, so certainly, the areas in the human visual system that seem to contribute to face perception are adjacent to, and in some sense, overlapping, um, areas that are contributing to face perception. Um, so it makes a lot of sense that, um, that the prosopinosics, people with face perception problems, would also have body perception problems. Um, and most recently, we've, um, we've compared the perception of faces with human faces and animal faces. And we've, there's, there's some evidence that prosopinosics also struggle to individuate uh, certainly dog faces. So, um, so again, as you can see, the, the prosognosics are in red here and the typical controls are in green. Um, there's a group difference both in um, their ability to individuate human faces and, and dog faces. So, so yes, in summary... Um, Prosopagnosia, particularly developmental prosopagnosia, sometimes called congenital prosopagnosia, is far more common than it was once thought. Um, there's evidence that it runs in families, suggestive of a genetic component. Um, this fits in very well with uh, evidence from twin studies and behavioural genetics. There's quite a lot of evidence now that there are um, differences in terms of the functional um, and anatomic properties of the, the visual system. Um, and in terms of the three questions that I posed, I think the, the condition is associated with a face perception problem, not necessarily a face memory problem. Um, you do see subtle deficits um, in terms of expression recognition, but, um, but these, are not, I, these typically are not uh, severe enough to hamper people's day-to-day um, -day interactions. And... There's, there's really good evidence that some, some individuals with prosopagnosia show other non-face perceptual deficits. Um, I think the, the kind of crucial question is whether um, some cases of developmental prosopagnosia are face-specific, um, 
or whether this is a kind of universal feature of all prosopagnosics, that they, um, that they exhibit problems with car identification and, and so on. Okay, so I'd like to finish by acknowledging my, my collaborators and the people who pay the bills. Um, thank you once again. Um, it's been a wonderful honour to, to give this looking lecture. So thank you very much. So on, on behalf of the school, thank you very much for a really excellent lecture and perfect timekeeping, in fact, so perfect that we must scootle out and um, enjoy the reception if you come into it. And um, uh, see some of you, I hope, next year. And um, thank you again very much. And uh, if anybody wants to pursue issues in conversation with the speaker, you'll be available. Thank you. Thank you very much.